very happy to be here. Let me just start by saying um, I tend to walk around a lot when I talk because I have ADD and I can't do one thing for very long. Um, so I might come down this way, I might come up this way, and I like to make these things a lot more informal. I don't like to lecture, I like to talk to people. And so it's fine if I don't do all the talking. I know we're going to have breakout sessions later on, but if you want to know something, then I'll, I'll try to come up with the answer, and if not, I'll make one up. Or you want to say something, there's a comment, an observation, you want to disagree with me about something, I want to hear it while we're here. And hopefully some of that will bring up some of the things that we can talk about later on when we get together in our more informal groups this afternoon. But this, this goes both ways, so it doesn't have to be me making all the noise for the next hour, okay? Um, so I, my, my specialty is neuropsychology. And so what that means is that I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I graduated from Drexel University in Philadelphia with my um, PhD in clinical and health psychology, and then I specialized in neuropsychology. So what I do is a lot of evaluation of cognitive disorders and things like that So in adults, so everything from Alzheimer's, stroke, but also chronic illnesses like MS, Parkinson's disease, things like that. Um, I was also really fortunate in the course of my training to get very good training in psychotherapy, which is not something that most neuropsychologists know how to do or even want to, which is really unfortunate because to me, every interaction with a patient, whether it's a 15-minute checkup, whether it's an interview, whether it's giving them feedback, is an opportunity to work with somebody on a level that might be helpful to them. And that's what I hope I can do with everybody here today. I don't have the answers to everything. I really, I really don't. And that's not really what psychologists are supposed to do. Come in and tell you how things are supposed to be and how you're supposed to. I, yeah, I know. I'll, I'll try, you know, but um, I may have some answers, but I don't have all of them. And because a lot of that is very personal to you and your own particular situation. So what I, my job is to help other people come to find out whatever the truth is about what they need. So, that is different for everybody in this room, even though you all deal with something very, very similar. But those issues are very, very personal. So some of this will apply, some of it won't apply, some of it will apply a little bit more to you than it might to somebody else or vice versa. But again, the point is to have a conversation about things that I think, I hope, I presume, are important to all of you and to come away with something that you can find helpful after you go home. Of course, if you're here in New Orleans, you might not want to go home. That's why I'm still here. I've been here for 12 years. I don't want to go back to Philadelphia. Um, because now, anything below 60 degrees, I consider life threatening. So, <laughs> so I'm going to stay. It doesn't snow here. Uh, I will never shovel snow again. So um, I will tell you that I made these slides quite some time ago, and I have no memory of what's on them. So it's going to be just as much of a surprise to me. We'll see how good my, my long-term memory is. Um, and so bear with me, and uh, we will see what we can do. And I need to this, I guess I go this way. OK, so these are some of the things that I wanted us to talk about today. And I hope that those are things that you wanted to hear about. If not, let me know that. So, um, and again, I, I approached this today from a broader perspective than just Kennedy's disease, because I think a lot of these issues are things that people who deal with chronic illness of any kind probably deal with. Um, and again, I see people with chronic illnesses that also affect mobility, and so I would be willing to bet that some of these things are also pertinent to you. So I thought we could talk a little bit about coping and what that means and what it doesn't mean and, and how, to, how to do it. Um, it's always on everybody's mind, sex and intimacy, right? And it should be. It's a really good thing. That's why we're all here, right? We wouldn't be here without it, right? So, um, treatment, things, uh, some discussion about depression. Um, we're going to focus on you guys. You, men never get any attention, right? So today you're going to get more attention because <laughs> you deserve it, okay? And then how that's related to relationships and, and couples and treatment around those issues and then some resources that I hope that you might find helpful. And I will, um, I can pass the specific information on to you, Kathy, you want to share it with people afterwards. Okay? So if, is there anything that's not on here that you want to hear about? I think you just think I think I can pack that into an hour? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, let me, I can talk pretty fast. So, so let's see. What we can do. Okay. 
So let's start by talking about, and I'm going to try not to stand in front of this, but I think wherever I am, I'm going to be standing in front of it, so I apologize for that. So everybody talks about coping. What is that? Does anybody have a definition of coping? Making do. Rolling, okay. Rolling with, rolling with it. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Adjusting to whatever situation. Okay. All right. Those all sound a lot better than the one I have up here because this is out of some academic paper that sounds like a lot of bad. But it, it really is true. So coping sort of is defined as this constantly changing cognitive and behavioral efforts, things we try to think, things we try to do to manage stuff that's going on. Plan B. Yes, plan B, right. And those things that are going on we experience as really hard, taxing, stressful, exceeding whatever our resources are, whether those are physical, emotional, financial, whatever you want to call them. And so that's kind of what we understand coping to be. But you know, I, I mean, it could mean lots of different things. Probably some of those we can't really define. And so if we can't really define it, then how do we tell somebody how to do it? That can be really tough. <clears throat> coping can be, a, we always look for adaptive ways to cope. We hope we do, but certainly lots of people engage in maladaptive coping. I've done it at some point in time, I'm sure. Um, it's just part of human nature. Part of the hard part is recognizing when we're doing it and making efforts to get out of it. And that's especially the case when somebody's dealing with something that's chronic. Because it's amazing how something that's abnormal can, can become normal over time. And that includes what we do to try to cope with stuff. The best example I can give you is what happened to pretty much everybody who lives here, um, who was here during Hurricane Katrina. I hate to bring it up, it's been seven years, but um, there are still issues with that that we all deal with here. So everybody here was affected by Katrina in some way or another, as you can imagine. And everybody was stressed and people were coping in lots of maladaptive ways. Um, I know I've seen it in my practice of people coming in with substance abuse uh, who have gained lots of weight because they didn't drink or smoke but they sure ate everything they could get their hands on. Um, whose relationships fell apart. All sorts of things happened. And that level of stress, because it was so pervasive here, really became the new normal. And we didn't realize it, because we were all so busy trying to get our lives back together. And so there was all this maladaptive coping that went on that none of us, because we were all in the middle of it, could say, hey, you know, we're really not doing so well here. What are we going to do about that? So it can be a very pervasive thing. Um, and so if somebody says to you, no, maybe you want to try coping with this a different way, Nobody wants to hear that, but it, it may be worth paying attention to sometimes. Well, you know, can I do something different that might be more helpful to me? Our coping can be reactive or proactive. So usually when something happens, whether usually we're not prepared for it, we have a reaction to that. And it might be good and helpful, and it might not be. Sometimes if we understand our situation a little bit better, we know that certain things might be coming, we can be more proactive about our coping. We can be more prepared about what we might do if A, B, C, or D, or all the way through the alphabet occurs. One of the things that's so difficult about stress, and this is no mystery to anybody in this room, is, is being prepared for the unknown. How do you do that? That sounds like an oxymoron. But knowing that something's going to happen eventually, and being prepared with just, first of all, accepting that and coming up with some potential contingencies can go a really long way in helping a person feel like they're in control. And control is such a big issue, no matter what, okay? So it's something to think about. Our, our coping can also be static or dynamic. We could adopt one way of coping and use it for everything. Sometimes it might work, sometimes it might not. Or we can be a little bit more dynamic about that and gives our, give ourselves some flexibility about how we might think about problems and ways we can solve them that make us happier. Okay? So coping's pretty, you thought it was simple, right? It's actually pretty complex. <coughs> Whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, well how do we do that? Well this is probably not very helpful. Um, <laughs> that's, I do that, you know, and put, try to put out a big fire if it gets really big with uh, not enough water, okay? This is the reactive 
COVID, probably. So there's really no one size fits all way to cope. Okay, um, and as you can imagine, like many things, um, this has um, received lots of attention and research, and we've sort of taken coping apart, and we understand a bit more what drives it, and um, we understand that it can be focused on many different things. So we can we can have appraisal focused understanding the situation. And, and what does that look like? Those, those are things that we tend to deny. We step away from the problem, we turn our back on it, we laugh it off, which is not a bad thing, right? Um, or we say, well, you know, that, that thing that I was trying to cope with that's now stressing me out, I don't really care about that anymore. Um, I'm gonna go care about something else that's less stressful, okay? We can be problem focused, so we can get hit with something and we're gonna learn as much as we can about it, um, and learn new skills to deal with it. And that's really great when doing something and learning new skills will actually help. But that's not always the case. So if the event's controllable, that might work well, but it doesn't always work in every situation. Or we can be emotion focused. So, as you would imagine, that's what I like, right? <laughs> in my line of work, that tends to make a lot more sense. So getting it out of our system, <laughs> venting, talking, whatever you want to call it, taking care of ourselves from the neck up, meditating. This is what works mostly in uncontrollable events. Okay. Um, so and we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Engagement versus disengagement kind of goes back to that appraisal based focusing that I was talking about. We can throw ourselves into the problem and try to get a handle on it and master it, or we could say, you know what, I'm out of here. I can't do this. I'm going to go find something else to worry about or do something else where I don't have to worry. And we can either do things by thinking about them, we can manage our situations by cognitive means or by behavioral means. Some work better for other people than others. Some work better depending on the situation than others. So you've got lots of options. Yes? If I Absolutely. It's okay. Um, I, remember no. the first, I remember the first conference I came to when I was first diagnosed with this condition, and I was in the problem focus. I was just gathering information. What do I have to do? I, what, right. what do I have to do? What What does this mean? Right. All that stuff. And the thing that I immediately noticed was that so many of the men are in the appraisal focus humor. Yeah. I mean, they're talking about their condition and they're laughing. Right. And I couldn't understand that at you weren't all. There yet. I was not anywhere close right. to there. I mean, they're talking about all these awful things. Huh? falling down or sure. I mean, th th these things that, that were so far removed from my life and I didn't understand. And, and I couldn't understand how they could be laughing about mm -hmm. such a serious thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm there now. I'm there now. And the part, I mean, the big part of it is just the support Absolutely. and the experience I've gotten from being here. Absolutely. And, and your own experience. Yeah. Own I mean, yeah. if there's anything in life that teaches, and teaches us anything, it's time. If we pay attention, right? And so it's probably a lot of all of that too. But the other thing that is important that I don't know that people are always so cognizant of is that you were willing to learn something else. You were willing to think about a problem in a different way. And if that, it, to me anyway, as a psychologist, that, just being willing to say, you know what, this is awful right now, but I think down the road I might be able to feel a little bit better about this, I don't know what it's going to look like, but those are the people who do the best, no matter what life hands them. Um, that's the opposite of hopelessness. And hopelessness is one of the key factors in depression that is very, very hard to get rid of. It is the key factor in what typically tips people over into suicide. So you basically allowed yourself to avoid hopelessness. And congratulations, because not everybody gets there. It's really good. Okay. Yes? Question. What if <coughs> your partner's preferred method of coping? And I won't yes. tell anybody you just winked at me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely uh, opposite yours? Yes. That never happens in oh, that okay. relationship. That I think you're probably imagining that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, yes, we could, I could come back tomorrow if you want to talk about that. 
<laughs> it's very difficult. It is really difficult. And we, and we will talk about it. It's not impossible. It's not impossible to get around that. Now, I will tell you, I, I do individual therapy. I don't see couples or, or families or anything like that because it's not what I'm trained in. But, you know, very often when I have a patient, their spouse is with them. And, you know, this one says A and that one says B. And, C is nowhere in the room, right? So um, it, it's, it is a difficult thing, but what, what you've already done is say, you know what? We think differently about this. And that's the beginning of the conversation. So it's the, it's the relationships in which people can't even acknowledge that they're on different planes of the problem that, that tend to not do as well. And then they come to someone like me and slap them in the shape. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know exactly where she's coming from. I admit, and then it's over. Yes. And if she has been within 50 yards of me and heard me vent, uh -huh. it upsets her so bad. Sure. And so I don't want to vent around her, and okay. it's, it's holding, I have to hold stuff in. You don't have to. Well, I go outside and vent. <laughs> Okay. But that's that's our problem. But well, that's your issue. Issue, yes. I don't see that as a problem. It would be a problem if you didn't realize that was happening. That's when it's a problem. Okay. So it's just an issue. What relationship doesn't have issues? So that doesn't worry me because you're already sitting here talking about it. You've clearly spoken with each other about it multiple times, right? You have no <laughs> I don't need to know how many. And I, I spent I spent all those years in school for something. Right? Um, and and you're perfectly happy to say it in front of a, a group of people. But if everybody was that good, I'd be out of business. So you're way ahead of the game. See? But we, we can talk about some of that too. But I'm glad you brought it up because that's very common. Okay. Now the good stuff, Ooh. right? Um, this is, it's such an important topic that nobody ever talks about. We did. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, we did. Oh, okay. <laughs> My <move> over here. <laughs> What's that first word? <laughs> yeah, well, but you know what? But no, I'm, I'm glad you said it. You brought up a really good point because are these the same thing? <laughs> No, so how, I don't think we need to define sex, right? But how do you define intimacy? What is that? Okay. Trust. Okay. okay, I want to hear from some of the guys. We can't hear the answers. The closeness, caring. Trust. Trust, okay. Sharing. Sharing. Anything else? Enjoying. Okay, communicating, right? Not one man ever says the word communicating, right? <laughs> we'll get into that too. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And I'm going to tell you that it's not your fault. But this stuff's so important to our quality of life. Again, like I said, it's important to our life because none of us would be here if it wasn't for sex, right? Um, we can thank our parents for that and then stop thinking about it after that, right? Um, it, you know, it's good for your mood. It really is good for your mood. All those hormones and stuff really are good for your mood um, and you don't need a prescription um, but we but nobody ever talks about it when was the last time if ever um, you went to the doctor for anything and your doctor actively said to you so how's your sex life do you know that actually happened to me once see now you're ruining so my talk <laughs> But you know what? But yeah, I'm sure you were shocked. Has anybody had that happen? Women too. I mean, men, women, and yeah. Your doctor proactively said, "So, how's it going? Yeah. Good. You're you're very fortunate." And then it happened to yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, ladies, I've never had a doctor say to me, "So, how's it going?" <laughs> <laughs> Not even my gynecologist, you know, you'd think she'd ask, right? What's that? Especially a gynecologist. <laughs> I mean, you know, she should know, right? Hey, how's it going? How's it going? You know? um, and, I, you know, why is that? Because regardless of why you're going to the doctor, it, it has a lot to do with your health, right? 
Um, and it, it just stuns me that, that healthcare, I notice I didn't say just doctors, but people in healthcare don't bring this up. And so how many times have you gone to the doctor for anything and you go, oh, I really like to talk about this, but isn't that their job to bring up the issue? I don't know whether I'm allowed to do that. Okay? It's not their job. You can bring up anything you want. Doctors are so, this is not part of medical training. The only specialty that, that typically delves into how a person's sex life is, is urology. And then they're talking about your prostate. So they're talking about mechanics. Not, you know, how is it from the neck up? Nobody ever asked you about that. And I know a lot of psychiatrists, a lot of my colleagues, don't even ask those questions when they're taking a history. And it, it's like the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It really needs to be addressed. Um, and so patients are often uncomfortable too because, you know, and I think and this says nothing about anybody in this room, but I think depending on what generation you come from, you go to the doctor and you're not supposed to be leading the conversation. They're supposed to be asking you the questions and you're going to be the good patient and you're going to answer the questions that they ask you. Good, I'm glad you're saying no because it should never be that way. Remember, they work for you. They work for you. So I tell people all the time, ask me whatever you want to know and if I don't have the answer, I'll find out for you. Um, so there's that discomfort level. And I always find it amazing that we're all so uncomfortable with this because aren't we surrounded by it all the time? I mean, you pick up a magazine, you go to the movies, you turn on the television, you get, it's all over the place. And yet we're not supposed to talk about it. Oh, this is a crazy country. Um, and there are lots of biases, too, about what this means. Um, very often, I think, there is this idea among the medical professionals that this person is coming to see me for a very specific reason. And why are they bringing up sex? Aren't you worried about your chronic illness? They must be in denial. Um, well, why is that important? You should be worried about your medication regimen. Your me Meanwhile, you couldn't care less about your medicine. You just you know, want to go have a good time. And that means a lot to you, and it should. And then there's a lot of misinformation. I mean, WebMD is great for some things, but I think you really have to be careful what you read out there. You know, so very often people who feel uncomfortable about speaking to their doctor or their partner or anybody else about these issues, what do we do? We get in the internet. Because you can find the answer to everything on the internet. You can find an answer, Wikipedia, right? Who wrote that? I don't know. <laughs> um, so you have to really be careful about the information that you get and the sources that you get it from because not everybody's an expert and around things like this it's better if we have expert help and i don't even i'm not an expert in this area either so i go to the internet i go to the professional ones yeah the ones you have to pay to join right? okay. so let, <laughs> let's let they really they take every penny you have Let's talk about treatment a little bit. So we were spending some time talking about coping, and then we get into treatment. So very often, you know, and gentlemen, you, you know this better than anybody, man's having problems with performance. He goes to the doctor. The doctor says, here, take this pill. Everything will be great. See you in three months. Um, and the treatment is focused only on physiology. And not everybody can take it anyway, right? You have a heart condition. I don't know what you're going to do, but you can't take Viagra Cialis in your heart condition. Um, and I want to, you know, I want to know what they're doing for ladies, by the way. You're supposed to be. That, people I know actually have prescribed Viagra for women. I don't know what happens, but. <laughs> I can't. I'm afraid to know. Um, but what we do know is that the, and then the, and this is what's called treatment. These are your treatment options, gentlemen. Pills. And what we know is that the efficacy of those treatments goes down the more chronic the illness we're talking about. So what do you do? Well, I don't know what to tell you, you know, Mr. Patient. Your the pills didn't work. Can't help you. Why are you worried about this again? Um, you have bigger things to worry about when, you know, it might be the biggest thing on your mind, right? So that's the problem with the medical approach. 
Now I'm all for the medical approach in lots of ways, but with this sort of thing, you got your pills or you got nothing. Well, you do have something. Um, but nobody ever talks about that, as we see. So now what we're doing, some people anyway, um, are emphasizing what we call the biopsychosocial model. And this takes into account not just you know, how your plumbing is doing, <laughs> but how is the rest of your life in relation to these problems with relations. Okay? So there's a lot more emphasis. People who practice from this approach emphasize things more about, so how's your relationship? Whatever that is, if you're married, involved with somebody, whatever, whatever it is. Um, to make you happy? Let's forget about the physical part for a minute. Is that okay? Is the quality of your relationship all right? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Has anyone ever asked you if you're depressed or anxious? Yeah? The doctor asked you that? And so it, it's kind of interesting because they say to you, are you depressed? Well, what if you're not sure? Because depression doesn't look the same in everybody. And we'll, we'll talk about depression in a minute. Are you anxious? Well, I don't know, if you get used to a certain level of stress and that becomes normal, how do you know? If you're anxious in a way, I, if you came to see me, I would think it would be significant, right? You get used to it, it's a new normal. And, um, and body image concerns and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, people who are providing treatment now um, that doesn't involve pills tend to focus more on this much more comprehensive understanding of how people are doing. Because we're all comprehensive people. We're not unidimensional. So all of these things matter. And some of these things matter more at some times than they do at others. But they're all really important. And so healthcare practitioners should be asking about this. And everybody should be thinking about this too. Not just, you know, is it working? But is the rest of my life working too? And if it's not in certain areas, then what do I need to do about that? Who can help me? Okay, so that's how we understand treatment a little bit more. Let's talk a little bit about depression. <laughs> can't feel that way. Um, I actually have that hanging on my office door every once in a while. Because um, it, it certainly does feel like that. Although sometimes you feel like you don't come back all the way. Um, depression is tremendously underdiagnosed in men and women. It's more common in women. Some people say it's more common in women because of men. I'm not sure. But the incidence, the prevalence rate in men runs about 10 to, um, five to 5 to 12%, just in the general population. In chronic illness, it could be up to 40%. Half. So if that's right, then almost half of the gentlemen in this room probably meet criteria for clinical depression. In women, yes. Uh, I would say that the guys that are making the decision to be here are not generally going to be in that 40%. Probably not. They're a self-selecting population. Mm -hmm. That's right. So think about your, your friends who aren't here and maybe reach out to them. But you're, you're absolutely right. Because you're, you're information focused, and, but also emotion focused, since that's what we're talking about. And, and that, that higher incidence rate is in individuals who are affected with a chronic illness that affects mobility. So again, I'm used to working with people with MS, Parkinson's disease, um, you know, things like that. Before I went back to graduate school, I worked for many years um, in a rehabilitation hospital in Philadelphia um, that uh, worked with brain injury, spinal cord stroke, patients with you know, no mobility in some cases. In, the levels of, and many of those, many of those patients were men, and many of them were young, in their 20s to early 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, the levels of depression were unbelievable, but very difficult to diagnose, because what does depression look like? How do you know somebody's depressed? <laughs> Anything else? Sadness? Can you see sadness? Quiet, withdrawn. Maybe withdrawn, yeah. 
often don't yeah. socialize a lot. Don't exactly, want to they isolate. Or... They isolate. The, the, actually, in adults and act, in children also, one of the most prominent symptoms of depression is irritability. Ooh. Irritability. Well, that's because of his coping oh, style. Yes. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> now we know. You feel better? <laughs> yeah. Your fault. It's your Always. <laughs> Um, we'll talk afterward. Go get you all straightened out. Um, it really is irritability and anger. Well, that doesn't look like depression. If somebody's foaming at the mouth, they don't exactly look sad, right? But that is very, very common. That, that's inability to cope. That makes them angry. Yeah. The, uh, you know, I, the thing I tell patients a lot is, you know, if you put five gallons of water in a three-gallon bucket, it's going it's to leak out somewhere. And that's usually how it does, is in behavior. Um, there are actually physiological reasons for that. When you're, when in the setting of depre depression, is an illness. Depression is a change in brain chemistry. The brain's not functioning right, so it can't handle threat well. And when it's threatened, it reacts to protect itself, and that comes out in, in anger and irritability. Okay, so. What we also need to understand is whether or not it's really depression or just the effects of the illness or sometimes the treatment. I mean, depending on what you're being treated for, I mean, you know, I think of my MS patients, those drugs are horrible. They make people really sick. They, should, they have no energy, so they're not going anywhere. They're isolated. They don't have the energy to talk sometimes. Um, so is it that? Is it just the effects of the illness itself? You're tired? Just don't quite have the energy to do what you did yesterday or the day before, or is it really depression? But sometimes it's all of that. And it takes some careful questioning to tease that out, okay? Um, because the symptoms overlap quite a bit. We talked about some of the associated behaviors, but if we would just see those things, we might not automatically assume that that person's depressed. Oh, they just don't feel like being bothered. They're tired, so they don't feel like hanging out with me. I understand that, right? It's when we start getting into other things like substance abuse, substance use. I can tell right after, as I mentioned before, right after Katrina, the rates of substance abuse skyrocketed in this town. I mean, we like to party anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think you've noticed that since you've been here. Has anybody, have you been down to Bourbon Street? Yeah. Okay, so I don't need to say anything else. Well, let me, I'll, I'll digress for one moment. The thing that's fun about Bourbon Street is if you go during the day, um, you know, there's, it's, it's fun, you know, it's sunny out, it's nice, the shops are open. Go at night, it's a totally different place. It's, it it's, has multiple personalities. It's really kind of interesting. I have a question. Yes? Why does the healthcare industry in this area allow people to wander the streets without open houses? Well, it's not our fault. Sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> We're out there too. <laughs> um, it, you know, I, I came from a state where if you wanted to buy liquor, you had to go to the liquor store. And if you wanted beer, you had to go to the beer distributor. And you didn't want them on Sundays because you couldn't get them. And I moved here. And I'll tell you, three days after I moved here, I was in Kmart pushing my cart around. And I walked past an aisle and I thought, I didn't just see that. And I backed up. An entire aisle in Kmart was cases of beer. Um, and I realized I'd moved to another planet, not just another state. Um, it, it's, we're, you know, it's a really good question. It's always been that way here. I mean, you can wander down the street with your alcohol as long as it's not in a bottle. Does everybody know what a go cup is now? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, Put your beer in a go cup and you can go. Uh, we, this place runs on tourism. When people come down here expecting Mardi Gras 12 months out of the year, so we don't want to take that away from them. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, but, you know, so in, in a place where substance use was pretty pervasive anyway, it really got out of hand after mm. Katrina. And again, it wasn't just drugs and alcohol, it was food. It was all sorts of bad behaviors that people did in excess to cope because nobody had their head on straight, so who was going to help anybody cope? That, that was, yeah, 
the prevalence was because the tourists didn't come and they'd been a moderating effect. <laughs> Without them, we saw the locals. It, 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 everything, I couldn't, yeah, I, it, it was um, it was like nuclear winter down here. There, nothing was normal. And so what do you do when things aren't normal? You have a Bloody Mary. <laughs> <laughs> or two. Or several. But I, really, you know, dealing with depression is, is one of the things that has probably one of the most predominant negative effects on people's relationships. And when you're dealing with something over a long period of time, and remember this kind of thing becomes normal, is it any wonder that those relationship problems become pervasive? And nobody recognizes it for what, the, for what it is, because it's just the way it is. And depression is, easy, it's not easy to treat, it's very treatable. Um, and accounts for so much of what goes wrong in, in chronic illness and its effect on, on relationships. Okay. So let's talk about coping again, a little more specifically. So when well, we're talking about sex again, because <clears throat> we can't ever get away from that, right? We know that the medical treatments that are available are limited. And when people don't have a lot of options, they make up their own. And very often, um, we default back into what feels safe and become even more rigid in how we cope because we're not quite sure how to manage this sort of stuff. So our roles become more rigid, our expectations of ourselves and other people become more rigid. That feeds into more depression, that affects relationships more, it becomes a vicious cycle. So what do we do about that? We try to help people understand that they can be a lot more flexible in how they cope about things. There's more than one way to do this the right way. Often that involves redefining how we understand what sex is, and then shift that focus also to intimacy. And we talked about that a little bit before. Um, but not, to, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, well, I can't do this anymore, so I'm just going to go work all the time. You know, I'm going to go. Uh, pursue some hobby all the time to the detriment of my family and my spouse and my kids and my friends or get over involved in other people, okay? When we see people who are willing and able to adopt a more flexible approach to their coping, meaning I'm going to do this now and I might do something else later on to see if it works, those are the people who do best. What it seems to do is help people feel more in control, especially of the unknown. So those of you who deal with this chronic illness know something's going to happen down the road. You don't know when. You don't know what it's going to look like when it does. That sets the stage, certainly, for feeling out of control. Being able, to the extent that you possibly can, say, you know what? I'm going to be a little more flexible in how I think about this, automatically puts you back in control of the situation. It doesn't change the outcome but it changes how you deal with it. And in life, that's all any of us can really do. Because we all, we all, we're all gonna have the same outcome in life, right? All of us, the thing we have in common. It's what we do before we get there that matters, okay? So we talk more about emotion-focused coping. We talked about, you brought that up before, is that something being really helpful? And it's really helpful, like we said earlier, because it helps with uncontrollable events. So, you know, for two people who fight all the time, I, I, you hold hands a lot. That's really sweet. I'm very cold. Oh, okay. I thought I was being helpful. Okay. Let me regroup. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that was great. So, so guys, now we're going to talk about you a little bit more. About, and especially with reference to chronic illness. You know, it really is true. Society is not kind to men. You guys have it rough, and it's unfair. It really is. Um, that That's that problem for me. Oh, yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm a guy. <laughs> what am I going to do? I'm a guy. But it really is true. Because society hands from a very young age, they do it to women too, ladies, right? We don't even realize it's happening, but they hand you all the set of expectations that means that you know, you're supposed to be Superman before you're 10 years old. 
it's we're surrounded by it. You know, our our understanding of gender roles is really set in stone before we're five years old. That's true for men and women. It's very insidious. The toys we play with, the, the kids we play with, the kinds of games we're allowed to play, the clothes we wear, what we watch on television, how we talk. Yes. I noticed that when I'm out in public, boys that can barely walk uh -huh. are fascinated by my school. Yeah. Little girls, they don't even Couldn't know. care less. I don't think that's something that we're forcing on them. Some of it's probably wired, but some of it is not. A lot of it is not. You know? So when babies, even though they can't talk to us, and all of you with children know this, um, absorb things like sponges. So if you're, the little boy is given trucks and Thomas the Tank Engine and all that kind of stuff, even when he's still a weenie in diapers, and little girls are given little teddy bears and things that are pink, and st it starts from the very beginning. But because we were all socialized that way, we don't realize we're doing it, because it's just what you do. Why is that little boy wearing pink? What, what you know, he's going to be gay or something like that. Unbelievable. Um, so some of it could very well be wired, but a lot of it is our fault. It really the is. Mental health is yeah, that's why we drink <laughs> <laughs> to get over the guilt. Yes, sir. I watched, I saw a comedian on a cruise ship one time talk about relationships. That's the best place to learn about life. That's from a comedian. At the end, at the end of his talk, he says, I'm a man, and I'm sorry. <laughs> That's funny. You know, somebody sent me a cartoon recently that says, Flower, how does it go? Flowers say I'm sorry. Louis Vuitton says I've learned my lesson. <laughs> Wow, I need to meet that person. Um, but it really is true. You know, society, gentlemen, society has done you a big disservice because they've handed you a pre programmed set of expectations that almost no man can meet. They've done it to us too, but we're not going to talk about that quite so much today because today's about not only you. Um, and everything is performance based, right? It's not how you feel about stuff, it's what you can do. And it has to be tangible. And you have to be able to show it to everybody. Your, your, where you went to college, the car you drive, the house you buy, you know, where do your kids go to school, how much money you have in the bank, what's your IRA look like, your, your retirement portfolio, I don't know about yours, but talk about mine. We we're probably all in the same boat after the last few years. So it's not who you are, it's what you can show the world. That's wrong. It's really unfortunate. And what they don't teach you how to do, in most cases, this is a really good statement I realize, is how to talk about how you feel about all of that. And certainly not how to talk about how you feel about all of that when you can't do. You're just supposed to deal with it. I don't know what that means. Does anybody know what deal with it means? Because I certainly don't. Deal with it means don't talk about it. Go figure it out on your own and stop looking like a crybaby. Okay? So, is it any wonder that that is why so many men, even though their prevalence rate of depression in the general population is low compared to those of us poisoned with estrogen, um, <laughs> is so much higher in the setting of a chronic illness, especially one that affects what you can do? Makes total sense to me. So this is, you know, again, without any show of hands, but, um, well, no, I will ask. How, gentlemen, how many of you have dealt with these sorts of things? How, how, how many of you have dealt with these sorts of things that run through your mind? Okay. It's, it's really unfortunate. It doesn't have to be that way. So then, of course, it affects your relationships. So, guys, as much as you may not want to admit it, marriage is good for you. Maybe you do want to admit it. Is that right? Would you agree? Because she's sitting right next to you. If you say the right, you're going to wear her soda if you say the wrong. Right. Okay. It really, it's good for all of us, actually, in most cases. Um, 
it's protective. It lowers our mortality and survival rates are higher. Um, people who are, you know, when your wife asks you to take your medicine, you're probably going to do better because you're taking the medicine. Okay? She does it because she cares. Um, and it goes the other way too. And it even helps our immune systems, believe it or not. The thing that's also true is that when relationships are distressed, those negative effects are worse than the positive effects of a good relationship. And that goes in both directions, for men and women. Okay? So when things are tough, it's going to be worse than if things are just okay. All right? We also know, this, this sounds kind of weird, but it's actually quite true. In couples where there's a chronic illness, and again, one that tends to affect the, person, the patient's mobility, can actually improve those relationships because it forces people to become more intimate in the way that we sort of talked about it before. Okay, if you can't do, maybe you can talk more. I've, I've had a lot of people who, again, with more degenerative physical illnesses say, you know, we, um, a lot of things we can't do anymore, but we sit around and talk more than we ever did. And I didn't realize my spouse felt that way about X, Y, and Z. We never talked about it before. We're actually closer now than we were before. Okay. It's also important to think about these things in, in the context of when the relationship, when the illness began within the relationship. So, um, and it can still work fine, you know, no matter what happens, but the ones that have the harder time are the ones where, you know, a person is injured in some way during the course of their marriage, they've already been together for a while, and then something suddenly changes. I saw this a lot with the patients with spinal cord injury who were paralyzed all of a sudden at the age of 35. Um, and they had some adjusting to do, and sometimes that didn't always work out so well. Okay, so all is not lost. Okay. When we talk about how people cope with this sort of stuff, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're psychologists, you know, we're, we put people on couches and ask them to talk about their mothers and all that sort of thing. Not really, but, um, we do talk about, we try to understand how a person developed their understanding of relationships. And that does go way back. And it's referred to as attachment, attachment theory. This helps us understand why people are doing what they're doing and not doing what they're doing in terms of their relationship better than anything. Because it's the foundation for all of our relationships with other people, not just our romantic relationships. There are different kinds of attachment. There's anxious ambivalent. Um, you may see this in kids that come from traumatic households where they approach and avoid their parents at the same time. They want affection from their parents, but they um, don't always get that. They're not sure what they're going to get, so that they approach and avoid at the same time. They're very ambivalent. Um, and kids who come from abusive households will often see a lot of avoidant attachment, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it really is a term that's used. They're defensive, they're repressed, um, they've been um, taught either to not have feelings or not express the feelings that they have, and so it's no, and then the, the one that's fine is secure attachment. Um, so it's no mystery that if this is what you learn when you're a little kid, you carry that into adulthood. We don't know this is happening. Our personality is pretty much formed by the time we're three years old three to four years old. And the thing that makes that difficult is so much of that happens before we're even able to talk about it, before we have language. So, so many of those important things that we learn about getting along and what we can expect from other people happen before we even have the words to express what that's like. So is it any wonder that 40 years later when somebody finds himself in therapy we start asking, well, you know, what was it like growing up in your family? And how it, uh, because the words aren't there. Those feelings aren't attached to anything that they can express. And that's when it gets to be a lot more work. Okay? But we can do it. And we can do it with a couple different approaches. Okay? 
I am trained in cognitive behavior therapy. That was really the focus of my training program. Um, and so the emphasis there is on understanding the relationships between how we appraise situations and how we act on them, and how those things reinforce each other. Um, there are, I don't, but sort of, in the context of what I do, um, use more emotion-focused techniques. You know, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about what you do, but we're going to talk a lot about how you feel. Really get it out and examine it for what it is, and see how it either helps you do well or um, makes things harder. Okay, I'm going to talk about treatment again. So, like we mentioned earlier, we're going to spend less time talking about the problem focused coping and emphasize the emotion focused coping. And this is where all of you can help with this process. So, you're out there trying to take care of yourselves and asking your healthcare providers to take care of you as well, knowing that they're probably not as equipped to do that as you would like with these emotional issues. Nothing prevents you from bringing it up and saying, hey, can we talk about this? Do you know, are you comfortable with having this conversation with me? If you're not, who can I go see? Who can help me figure this out? There, there is one particular model of counseling that is specific to um, sexuality. And this is something that actually some medical training um, programs focus on. It's called PLICIT. And it goes through several steps. And this really, you know, it, I think it, it's very helpful, but it really it's not necessarily for the patient. It's more for the doctor <laughs> to help them feel more comfortable about talking about these issues. Okay, but it, it does seem to work quite well. And again, you all can really help. Uh, you mentioned, you know, how helpful it was to talk to your your peers here, who had been dealing with this longer at that point than you or had. Or just hearing them. Talk sure, right. And so everybody here has knows somebody who's been dealing with this less time than you have. And even though you might not fit, you know, you're dealing with your own things and they're difficult, but you've already learned something about coping with all of this that somebody else will find beneficial. And because you live with it, you understand it better.